So for those who haven't been in this class, uh, uh, unfortunately, we're almost halfway through Daniel. So uh, that uh, it would be hard to do a review of the whole half of the book. But uh, hopefully this will be of a, a good lesson. Because that's always a problem when you're doing a long series like uh, the whole book of Daniel is that uh, people come and go. And unfortunately, it doesn't always fit in to where you are in that particular week. But we are in Daniel 7, and we're going to take on the first eight verses today. Uh, this is the uh, end point. Let me bring up my little chart here. Let me see here where are we at. Okay, here's our little chart we've been kind of going on, and just to see where we, where we fit in to the overall uh, scheme of he things here. As I pointed out in the beginning, you can see how Daniel itself is broken up uh, into, uh, obviously, chapters, but uh, I, what I wanted to point out is the fact that uh, it's written in two different languages, uh, Hebrew and Aramaic, and that kind of divides the book up, and we're getting ready to finish up the section that's in the Aramaic which is chapter 7. And, that, and we consider that to be the Gentile period of history that Daniel uh, was, uh, was uh, envisioning uh, in prophecy uh, of a period of time starting where he was at in 586 B.C., or 605 B.C., until the current time frame. Right now we're, we're towards the end of, uh, of the Gentile period here in chapter 7. And... Uh, and so we're ending up with the uh, prophecies that primarily uh, equate to the Gentiles' nations. And we're going to be heading in back into the Hebrew nations in chapter 8. So I'll give you a kind of an idea where we're at. Uh, and we've just, the funny thing about this particular chapter is it's kind of going backwards a little bit. Uh, in chapter uh, 6, we just left off at Daniel was already dealing with uh, Darius, which was the, uh, the kingdom of Medes and Persia. We'll go back to the first year of Belshazzar here in chapter 7, uh, in the first year that he was uh, reigning. So we've gone back since chapter 6, about 17 years. And this is a vision that Daniel had back when Belshazzar uh, was first reigning. Uh, and of course, what we saw last chapter is Darius had just taken over. So chapter 6 ended at uh, 539 B.C., but we've kind of gone back to about 556 B.C. when Belshazzar started reigning, uh, just for this chapter. And then when we move into the Hebrew, we're kind of going to a history of the Hebrew nation going forward. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about here in the future will be a lot of it is prophecy of the future. Uh, so I guess kind of wanted to give that a little bit of an overview of where we're at. And let me go back to my uh, other display here. And as I was telling other people, these pictures, these paintings, were paintings done by a, uh, a man that, uh, that Pastor Silcott first introduced us to and when we did the Revelation study. And he also did one for Daniel, so I've been kind of putting them up there just as like a backdrop. The aim of this particular artist was to try to take biblical knowledge and put it into a painting to help people that are uh, maybe hearing impaired, uh, that they can better understand the Bible through through visual art, and it's some pretty interesting stuff he done. So uh, today's picture is starting off with this dream that Daniel had. This dream is very very similar to the one in chapter two. Uh, the creature is different. Uh, the, this is uses four animals, versus the one in chapter two had to do with Nebuchadnezzar's dream, that was of a, a statue. I'll try to show some of the similarities between the two, and that's kind of like where we're at. So in Daniel, sign in Daniel 7, 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. 
Then he wrote the dream and told us some of the matters. Some things I want to point out here. There's a lot of similarities, too, between uh, what we read in Daniel and what we read in Revelation. And so I thought I'd point out some of the similarities, too, that we're going to see it quite a bit as we go through this chapter. And so I wanted to point to Revelation 1.19, talking about writing down things. Uh, here, uh, of course, John writing down things similar to what Daniel was told to do. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And this is kind of similar to what Daniel is basically saying here in chapter 7. He's going to be writing down these visions that he had that uh, are going to talk about things that are going to be happening. Or th and actually, some things that have already happened, too. Because uh, at least at this point, uh, the, uh, the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar has come to an end. So Daniel, within Daniel's dream, the first figurine here we see here of this painting is going to be of the lion and which stands for, uh, in this vision, for Nebuchadnezzar, or the king of Babylon. Okay, Daniel 7, 2. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And talking about winds, again, trying to show some of the correlations we see. Uh, over in Revelation 7, 1, we see, uh, talk about winds again. And this kind of gives us an idea when, when the Bible talks about winds, what it might be talking about. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the winds should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And talking about the great sea, I also want to point out a few things about symbology we see in some of these, sea, in some of these things. You see the word great sea there. Whenever you see sea in the Bible, it typically is talking about nations uh, and the people that come up out of those nations. And in this particular case, it would be the Gentile uh, nations of this particular time, based on where we are in Daniel. And so uh, some other places we see this to kind of correlate uh, what sea means. And we go over to Matthew 13:47. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. Again, kind of symbolizing uh, people, people groups. Over in Revelation 13, 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. Keep an eye on this verse. This sounds very similar to what we're going to be talking about in Daniel. Again, trying to show the correlation between the two. Daniel was kind of foreseeing the future at, up until the period of time that uh, John takes over and kind of expands on that. Also, Revelation 17, 15. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whole sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Again, defining what seas is. Okay, back to Daniel, verse 3. So we're talking about four beasts. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, diverse from one another. I'm just going to shoot ahead uh, uh, to verse 17, just to kind of describe what these beasts are. We're, going to, we're not going to get into, the, I'm going to try to get uh, through uh, verse 8 today. So this verse won't be until next week, probably. But it'll kind of help us to see what these beasts are. And in verse 17, it says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. So again, the, the basic symbology here is still continuing of these uh, beasts representing uh, world leaders that come up out of the uh, uh, water. So it's very similar, like I said, to the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. With some slight differences, because uh, Daniel's dream is going to be more about, uh, with, with Nebuchadnezzar's dream, it was more about political, it was more about an uh, external uh, vision of what these kings were going to look like and who they were, where Daniel's is going to be addressing more the political uh, and the cultural aspects of these four kingdoms. So there are slight differences between the two visions. And some other things about these uh, these particular beasts, as you take a look at them, and, and their general uh, aspects of them are of uh, 
of tyranny and oppression emerging from wars Bringing from wars and commotions of the world, we will get into more detail as we study the interpretation of these. But I'm just, again, this week is more about just identifying them and how they correlate to the original uh, uh, vision of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, when I think about this verse, it kind of reminds me, of, we've already seen the, the basic history of Nebuchadnezzar, how he started out, he was a, a really mean, uh, domineering kind of a world leader. And based on what uh, happened during his, time, his lifetime, uh, I think he became much more gentle, and he also recognized that God uh, was the one true God. As we, as we went through the first four chapters of, the, of Daniel. So I can see that this particular vision here that Daniel had, it kind of symbolizes uh, Nebuchadnezzar's reign. I start off as a lion and, it, uh, and plucked his, uh, his wings. So he basically was made more, uh, he was kind of brought back, back down to earth. It's kind of like what it's saying. And a man's heart was given to it like, it, like he grew a new heart. And I think that that's what's symbolized by this particular vision so I thought I'd correlate it to what we saw in Daniel 2 for this same period. Daniel 2.37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And to whosoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So again, that's the correlation to the original dream. But later on, he grew a heart. And I always wanted to point to that real quick, too. Over in Daniel 4, 31 through 37 is when uh, he talks about this. Chapter 4 is actually written by Nebuchadnezzar. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. This is God speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. And they shall drive thee from men, and the dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. Thou shalt make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee. Until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his heirs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Kind of see the symbology here of the uh, eagle's feathers too, along with the symbology uh, that Daniel has. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and made understanding return unto me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Jumping down to verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. So he learned his lesson. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are true and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. I truly, truly believe that we're going to meet Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. Uh, it looks like he turned completely around. But I also can see that uh, that vision of the uh, of this particular kingdom by Daniel kind of correlates very well with it, too. Over in Daniel 7, 5, back to there. Now we're going to move into the second beast. And this is a, uh, the, the uh, picture for the second beast. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side. It had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Well, this correlates back to the uh, Medes and Persians. And uh, we see this in, chat in, uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2.39. And after thee shall arise another king. Now realize also, too, that at this point of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, 
they did not know what the next kingdom was going to be because we were still in, ba in a Babylonian kingdom. Where now, uh, at least Daniel at this point in his vision knows what kind of kingdom it's going to be. So that gives us a little bit of a clue of uh, how far we've moved in, within world history. And after the, uh, thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And this also is mentioned, and we'll see it uh, in a couple of weeks when we get to chapter 8, in verse 820. It's going to be talking about another creature. And this, again, is moving into the Hebrew uh, prophecies. So we'll take a look at this, but I wanted to point to it. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media, Media and Persia. And one other thing I might mention is that the uh, three ribs in his mouth, most uh, uh, Bible teachers I've read through figure that that threefold dominion of the Second Empire is uh, the three ribs is a, is a uh, uh, reference to the threefold dominion of the Second Empire, Media, Media, Persia, and Babylonia. And it says devour much flesh. And that typically symbolizes, as world history dominated, uh, that uh, that particular kingdom also uh, uh, devour, uh, took over Lydia, Babylonia, and Egypt. So that's what the three ribs being devoured kind of stands for. Okay, verse 6. And after this I beheld and lo another, like a leopard, which had... Oh, time to change perches again. This, this, this particular artist did a separate painting for each one of the creatures. And here we have a leopard. And leopard stands for Greece. And Greece was uh, led by Alexander the Great. But you didn't know you are going to come to a history lesson, too. Uh, beauty of Daniel is it, for, it, it follows history really well. I think a lot of the, the controversy about Daniel, some people like to try to say it was written well after all of this stuff happened because it was so accurate about the world empires of that time frame. But Alexander the Great was, uh, took over almost the whole known world so quickly that that's why he's symbolized by a leopard, one of the fastest creatures on earth. And as a matter of fact, he committed suicide because he was so depressed because there was nothing else to, to conquer that he died a young man because of uh, suicide. Uh, so again, the leopard stands for the swiftness of Alexander's conquest. He took over, like, quickly. I think, I, and which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And these kind of stand for, and we'll look more into it when we get into the uh, specifics of the interpretation. But what it's talking about there is that uh, his kingdom gets, ends up getting divided up into four uh, sections by his uh, by four of his generals take over uh, for the kingdom after he dies. So that's where the four wings of a fowl <clears throat> and the four heads comes from. And the correlate back to uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we see that in Daniel 2.39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So again, it kind of both uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's dream show that uh, uh, the same basic uh, uh, prophecy. And we'll also see this again when we get to chapter 8, verse 21 and 22. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up from it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Uh, and that's talking about the four generals that's going to end up taking over the Alexander's empire. We'll get into that more in, in uh, chapter 8. And a couple other places we see this same symbology in chapter 10, verse 20. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I came unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Gracia shall come. This is during a period of time when Daniel is fasting and praying, and he's waiting for the uh, uh, an angel to come meet him. And uh, so that uh, he's re the angel is actually telling him of uh, the future, which hasn't quite happened yet in Daniel's life. And we'll see it again over in Daniel 11, 2 through 4. 
And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. So given a kind of a, a real overview of the latter, the latter part of Daniel here and what we're going to be talking about, uh, a lot of uh, what's coming up is going to be a lot about the prophecies that I can see they have twofold meaning, so it would be really fun to kind of see how some of these play out in world history. Okay, back to Daniel 7.7. 7. And this I saw in a night vision, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. And realize still at this point that, that Daniel has no clue what these, what these particular uh, kingdoms are. Because uh, even though he's seen uh, the Medes and Persia, he has no, no idea about Greece or about Rome. So I night, uh, again, beginning at verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and had great iron teeth. Well, let me change my picture. Here's Rome. Painting for Rome, I should say. Strong sea land had great iron teeth, it devoured and broke in pieces and, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. That ten horns hasn't happened yet, uh, even, even now in 2022. So I kind of give you an idea about where... Uh, Rome would be, uh, is in two phases, and uh, it'll be interesting to see as we get to that one uh, how that plays out in world history. Some companion verses for this. We'll see them when we get to the latter part of this chapter over in verse 23 and 24. Then he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns of this kingdom are the ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. That's an important little se uh, sentence right there. That's talking about the Antichrist. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall sub subdue three kings. And again, that's all future. So we're going to be talking about that as we go along. Now, correlating back to uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we see that back in uh, chapter 2, verse 40 through 43. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest mixed, I am mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Interesting verse right there. I uh, have my own theories about that verse, which is well, quite controversial, but uh, we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> We're also going to see this again in chapter 9, verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. This is basically, uh, going to love teaching this part. Uh, Daniel 9 is uh, quite the chapter, and we'll have a lot of fun with that one particularly talking about the timing and how, uh, how accurate it is. Uh, but basically, this is when Rome was destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD, is what uh, it's basically talking about here. I might also point out a, a horn symbolizes a king. I think we already determined that. Uh, 
let's see. Uh, okay, and also in Daniel 7, no, on to Daniel 7, 8. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there was three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Again, uh, that's 99% uh, of the people that talk about this verse are convinced that this is talking about the Antichrist. It will be future. Uh, we won't see him. We'll be gone. But that uh, lots of people are speculating who he might be these days. I don't believe that we will find out. Uh, we'll probably, uh, as I like some people like to say, we'll see it from the mezzanine from, uh, from heaven. But that's what it's talking about here. So we're going back to like 536, I mean 586 BC. And it's just amazing to me uh, that Daniel was getting these visions and how accurately they're, they're portrayed out in world history. But correlating back to this particular period of time, Back in Daniel 2:33 through 35 is where we see this with uh, Nebuchadnezzar. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till thou that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, and they were of iron and clay, and break them into pieces. This was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer thrashing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain filled the whole earth. That's talking about the return of Jesus Christ with us at the end of the tribulation. Jumping down to verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. If you know anything about the Roman Empire, they were a very... Uh, they, they, they ruled with an iron fist. That's how they, uh, they used violence and uh, threats of violence to uh, control the populace. So this, this prophecy is very accurate of the initial Roman Empire. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of part is clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it no strength of iron for as much as they saw us the iron mixed. I already read this part before, so I won't read it again, but it uh, Again, talking about the, uh, the second phase of the Roman Empire, which most people believe is the, uh, the world of the Antichrist uh, during the Tribulation. And I just also wanted to mention about the symbolization of the horn. Uh, we see this also in Revelation 17, 12. And the ten horns, again, correlating where Daniel and Revelation kind of uh, go together really well. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as of yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. So if you really think about this, we're going from 586 B.C. until 100 A.D. when, when John had this vision. And it, uh, 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 so we can see that some of these things have not happened yet, even in our time frame, because it, uh, uh, in 70 A.D. Rome was destroyed. Uh, Rome destroyed Jerusalem. So a lot of these prophecies, you can see that they're definitely future uh, versus uh, them being in the past. You'll sometimes hear people talk about that. that uh, we're going to talk about somebody called and it works, he's, uh, Epiphanes uh, here in a, sh in a minute. And he was a uh, ruler during the uh, about the 136 B.C. time frame that uh, most people say was the... Uh, was like the, the uh, forerunner of the Antichrist. Uh, he actually uh, committed that abomination of desolation that uh, Jesus talks about in Matthew. And he did that also in the temple by sacrificing a pig on the uh, altar. And so a lot of people see him as an exact correlation to the Antichrist. And so we're going to get ready here. And I'm kind of going to go through a little bit of what, uh, what he's about just to give a little bit of context what we're going to be talking about. As, as Daniel considers these visions of the ten kings, there rise up amongst them a little horn, uh, which is another king, who subdues the three kings so completely that they separate the identity of the kingdom that is destroyed. So whatever those three kings are, we don't know yet, uh, but they will be so utterly destroyed that they won't even be, uh, people won't even remember they even existed. 
and the seven kings of the ten are left, and this little horn, uh, he is called the king of fierce continents, uh, typified by that other king of fierce continents, or the preview of the Antichrist. And I thought I would just really quickly, uh, so we got a little bit of time here. I got a bunch of verses that talk about this particular, uh, I was trying to decide how to split up Daniel, and I thought this was a good time to talk about the Antichrist. He goes by a lot of different names in the Bible. And I thought I'd just point to a few. And where we see this particular, uh, in Xerxes, uh, ep I can never pronounce his right name right, Epiphanes, He's mentioned over in Daniel 8, 23 through 25. Some people like to say that there was nothing uh, talked about uh, the, what they call the 400 missing years uh, between Malachi and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, the New Testament. But they're actually foretold in Daniel, and that's where we, get, uh, we see this, uh, this, this particular ruler and it hurts these uh, epiphanies mentioned. And it's in Daniel 8, we'll be talking about him. And he's going to be reigning in about the 136, I think, B.C. time frame. And uh, so, this in, uh, so in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have come to full, a king of fierce continents and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. This is the part I wanted to point out. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper in practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace he shall destroy many. Notice that word there, by peace he shall destroy many. Most people say that's how the Antichrist is going to gain power, is he's going to do it through diplomacy at first. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. So I thought I'd talk about some of these names given to this, uh, this future Antichrist. And the princes shall come, that's one of them. In, nine, in Daniel 9, 26, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's another name for it there. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. 9.27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of that week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of the abomination he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon a desolate. What we're talking about here is what happened in 70 AD, uh, and what's going to happen in the future with the future Antichrist, when the Antichrist does it uh, in the, uh, during the tribulation. I'm more pointing to just some of these uh, names given to the Antichrist through, through the uh, Bible. This is kind of like a little bit of a preview, because the next section in Daniel is talking about Jesus Christ and, uh, and how he comes on the scene. I didn't want to get into it today, because I think I needed a whole lesson uh, to do it. So I kind of tacked this on at the end, just to point to a couple of places where we're going to see different names for the Antichrist. And how, he, uh, and how Satan tries to copy what Jesus does. Because Jesus does a similar thing. It's in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, where he has, a, uh, has seven different names for himself. So to try to mimic Jesus, Satan is always trying to do the same thing. And that's what Antichrist really means, in, in place of the real Jesus Christ. So the Antichrist is going to try to copy everything that Jesus does. And so this is why uh, we see these different names, I believe, is because he's trying to copy what Jesus Christ is also doing and the different names that Jesus uses for himself all through the Bible. So Daniel 11:36, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of horses, and the God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. The God he's talking about here is the God of uh, uh, this earth, better, who, put, who put himself there. He's not really a God, it's Satan. 
Uh, so when you see, whatever you see God with a, uh, a little g, that's usually typically talking about a man who thinks himself as God. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause him to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. Again, this section we're talking about uh, uh, the prince that shall come. I'm sorry, the king of Daniel. Uh, uh, we're in uh, talking about the king here. He calls himself a king. And let me jump down. I'm going to a lot of verses here on it. The abomination we see in Daniel 12:11. From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination to make it desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Uh, again, this is talking, as we get to these chapters, you're going to see a, a lot of prophecy about what's going to be happening in the future. Kind of excited about it. And this is also a correlation to the same thing we're going to see in Matthew 24, 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, Whosoever read let him understand. Uh, that's Jesus talking there in Matthew. And uh, that's a great verse that people want to try to say that uh, Daniel didn't exist and was not a prophet. Well, if they don't believe Jesus Christ, they got a bigger problem than whether or not Daniel was a prophet. <laughs> because here Jesus confirms that. In the other place, uh, he's known as the man of sin. And we see that in 2 Thessalonians. 2, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. This is Paul talking to Thessalonica. And now you know that with what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth both already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And this is again talking about the man of sin, uh, the uh, wicked one. And in Revelation 13, 4 through 10, is where we see uh, his reference is he's called the beast. Yeah, I think I've read enough of these. Get the general idea that, uh, and I might touch base on some of these more as we as we move into the uh, uh, these particular ch chapters that we're going to see in the rest of Daniel. So I think I'll stop there. And uh, any questions of any kind? Anybody have? You know, a lot of information in there. It's kind of kind of giving a little overview of where we're going from here. Okay, well, we'll end with a prayer. Thank you, Lord, so much for these uh, these promises, these prophecies you give us, Lord, to kind of uh, help us to see the future, so we get can get excited about your coming kingdom. And Lord, I know so much that uh, uh, looking forward to it, uh, looking for that day you return and take us home. We give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.